Hello everyone and welcome back to our Facebook channel which occurs here every Friday at noon. My name is Brianna, I'm a Sustainable Transportation Vermont intern and I'm here to announce our speaker today who's Hannah November and she will be talking about the not so subtle overlaps between food, the food system and transportation. Um, in this presentation, she's gonna discuss and highlight the role of transportation in our food system in relation to access, um, equity, and overall sustainability. Um, Hannah is a rising senior at the University of Vermont. She's majoring in environmental science with a concentration in ecological design and a minor in community and international development. Hannah develop, has developed a special interest in sustainable and ecologically focused food systems. So I'm gonna bring Hannah up now. Um, so I'm Hannah. I am a Sustainable Transportation Vermont intern um, this past summer, and I'm winding down my internship with this presentation about food and transportation, which is something I've grown to be really passionate about. Um, so something I wanted to start with is just some um, simple definitions. Um, so the food system is um, pretty much the entire system that encompasses all stages of like keeping an individual fed. So it starts as a seed from the production of food um, up until uh, consumption and also um, like disposal and the waste system. And then there's also food insecurity, which is the state of not having reliable access to enough healthy food that you can afford. Um, and so transitioning from that, we just brought up food insecurity. Um, and so before the pandemic started, um, one in nine people in Vermont struggled with hunger. Um, and since June 2020, that number has actually risen to one in four Vermonters, which is pretty huge. And that's a study done by UVM. Um, and a lot of different factors also affect that statistic. So if you're in a house with children, you're actually 3.5 times more likely to be food insecure also. And um, going off of that, nearly one in 10 Americans live in a community where there's no healthy and affordable um, food stores within one mile of their home. And this is something that's referred to as a food desert. And they disproportionately affect low income families, um, people of color and rural communities. Um, so food deserts generally lead to affected individuals and populations having to travel farther than desired to have legitimate access to food. Um, this is especially true when considering the lack of personal vehicle ownership um, within these affected communities. So that two thirds of low income individuals access their food from a form of transportation other than a personal vehicle. Um, and so that could mean walking, biking, or using public transportation. And one important parallel that's worth highlighting um, is that those same communities that are so heavily dependent on public transportation are also those same communities that are battling food insecurity. Um, so now more than ever, we need to you know, put in sustainable infrastructure that supports them. Um, and this is a statistic from the Safe Routes Partnership. So it's um, from data that was gathered all over the country. So going off of that, 45% of Americans in 2019 had no access to public transportation. Um, this is a huge number and it's definitely an equity issue and it's a race issue and it's a class issue. Um, it's something that we need to be devoting our city planning initiatives to in the future to make better um, communities for all. Um, so we all know like the benefits of public transportation during normal times. Um, and in 2019, Americans took, um, you can actually go back to the last slide, Brianna, sorry, thanks. Um, in 2019, Americans took 9.9 .9 billion trips on public transportation. Um, and one thing that's really important about that number is that there are really distinct demographics that are utilizing public transport more than others. And these are populations that we call transit dependent. Um, so the first one of these is um, low income riders. So two thirds of riders have household incomes less than $50,000 a year. And um, middle class is generally defined as individuals that make 40,000 and up. 
So at an income of $50,000 um, a year, the majority of riders are like hovering right about middle income and uh, middle income and below. And then additionally, 20% of riders make less than $15,000 a year. Um, and in addition to that, we also have like older adults that maybe can't drive, um, individuals with disabilities who also maybe not be able to drive, um, youth and people of color, which are actually three to six more times more likely to use public transportation than white individuals um, and rural households. Um, so there are a lot of reasons why we need to be investing in better transportation infrastructure for our communities. Um, so the first reason is to be creating intentional access to goods and services. Um, it's transportation is like completely vital to communities in terms of um, accessing places of employment, schools, um, and community resources like stores and hospitals. Um, and we really need to be intentional about public transit routes because they create efficient networks of opportunity for riders to access these goods. Um, and another one is to increase environmental sustainability, which might seem kind of like a no-brainer um, here, but the more people that are willing to engage with transportation infrastructure means that less of them will be relying on personal vehicles to access um, daily needs. So it's proven by the American Public Transportation Association that communities that invest in public transit reduce the nation's carbon emissions by 37 million metric tons annually, which is huge. Um, and also at this point, it's pretty clear that there's a direct access, a direct relationship between public transportation and food access. Um, food security and access to vital nutrients are essentially a human right. Um, and by investing in sustainable transportation, we can assure that that right is respected for all individuals who really need it. Um, and then lastly, so um, this point kind of comes as a combination of all of these other factors, meaning that we need to be aiming to increase the overall ridership on public transportation. Um, so the more people that engage with public transit, the more or the more efficient they work. Um, so this also includes people that are riding public transportation by choice instead of by need, um, because increasing this population rallies like more community support, um, which is especially important in local politics and to ensure um, a steady stream of funding. And so you might kind of be wondering what better um, transportation infrastructure actually looks like. Um, and so this concept is different in all cities around the world. Um, and some of them could definitely be implemented in Vermont. So um, the first point is improving mainstream public transportation. Um, and a pretty important overarching theme is that we need to really be prioritizing um, public transit as opposed to cars. Um, so currently in Vermont, most people travel by car, but there are also um, buses, like few trains and ferries, but um, in the future we should be looking to implement more infrastructure that can accommodate um, rail amenities for longer distances around the region and also within the state. Um, to improve access and um, more ridership across all fronts, we also need to make more efficient routes and stops so that people can really get where they want to go quickly and easily. Um, in addition, this is especially important given the public health crisis, um, but we really need to make people feel safe while they're riding public transportation. Um, so this could mean improving the cleanliness of transportation interiors and shelters, um, but it also just means making people with a variety of needs feel comfortable using these systems. Um, in addition to all of these, it kind of goes without saying, that to incentivize these systems, they need to be made fair free for everyone who might need it. Um, and then um, transportation infrastructure doesn't just include public transportation because there's also more independent forms of mobility that have their place in our communities. Um, so we need to make resources safer for those who travel like on the ground, um, which means that bike lanes and bike paths should be wider with more effective buffers from traffic. Um, we also need more strategically placed bike racks 
so that um, we have an insured safe holding spot for users when they're needed. And then in terms of pedestrian infrastructure, um, we really need to provide safer sidewalks and crosswalks to minimize pedestrian injuries and fatalities. Um, and what also goes along with this is more vehicle free streets like Church Street, which can improve these possibilities for everyone. Um, so we kind of took a step back um, to look at how the transportation infrastructure could be made better, but now we need to like rework food into that equation also. So service planning is the idea that we um, are structuring around the concept that we need to make it easier for people to get the food that they need. So this means planning bus routes and train stations um, and the like around grocery stores, farmers markets, and food pantries, um, because doing this makes it, um, again, just easier for people to access what they need. Um, doing this requires kind of a lot of resource optimization and general planning, but it's definitely a necessity. Um, so some examples of service planning are like a bike path that leads to major grocery stores or bus routes that stop at highly trafficked food pantries. Um, and then another planning solution to food access is the idea of co-locating, um, which is making um, our planning systems so that several essential services are done in the same place. Um, so for the same reason that a lot of gas stations have like a full stock of like groceries and useful items, um, we should be giving public transit venues those same amenities to make those um, necessary resources more convenient to individuals. Um, so some examples of this are like farmers markets that are located at a train station and then, you know, small convenience stores inside a bus terminal. So two pretty like small examples, but definitely possible and achievable. Um, so now I'm kind of going to transition onto how um, COVID-19 changed the food system. So the current pandemic has essentially changed everything that we do in every realm. Um, for the time being, and especially from a food perspective. So first and the most obvious example of this is um, from the standpoint of accessibility. Um, and this is mostly in terms of financial needs. So um, a study from UVM found that 50% of ha Vermont households have actually lost employment or have had it disrupted since March. Um, in addition to this, there's been a 68% increase um, for the use of food pantries and a 49% increase in SNAP use, which is kind of the modern day food stamp. Um, this is also dispropor disproportionately affecting people of color, children, and those without a college degree, um, as seen on the graphic on the right. And overall, um, this really just means that people are having a really hard time paying for food right now. So um, another aspect of the food system is the concept of distribution, because, you know, as you know, not everything we eat is grown in Vermont. Um, so our food is being transported across the country, but also sometimes around the world, depending on what you're eating. And with the spread of COVID affecting all regions differently, transporting and selling food across these boundaries has really been affected as to what we can eat here and um, the time it takes for it to get here. So lastly um, is the topic of food availability, which just relates to um, where we get our food and how much of it we can get. A lot of small farms in the area have been affected by the pandemic because in some cases they've had to shut down with no workforce available to harvest um, and distribute their food to local establishments. Um, in terms of con more conventional grocery stores, there's also been a considerable lack of non-perishable foods available to the general public. Um, this is mostly due to the fact that going grocery shopping comes as an increased risk for a lot of people. So they feel like they need to overcompensate and make fewer trips, but buying a lot more food, which just leaves less food on the shelf for others. So a really great solution to this is independent food production, which is also just known as gardening. Um, so I'm gonna talk about the importance of producing your own food during the pandemic. 
Um, so the first point here is that um, during a pandemic, there's such a graded risk of going to the grocery store. And a lot of people who might be immunocompromised in any way um, see this as a big barrier to receiving food. Grocery stores are definitely an essential service at all times, but um, they could be kind of risky for some people. Gardening is also a really great way to get outside um, in a very low risk transmission activity during these times. In addition, it also provides you with a lot of food independence. So our food system is pretty centralized as it stands today, but um, engaging in this helps um, give you the potential to separate yourself from this system, which can provide um, a little bit more food security um, in the event of um, like economic disasters or natural disasters that might affect the food system. Um, gardening is also really cost effective. So while there might be an initial startup cost for plants and soil, there are a lot of assistant programs out there to alleviate some of these costs. Um, and in some ways it's actually the gift that keeps on giving because a lot of varieties will continue to produce food throughout the growing season. Um, and so lastly, eating local in general is a really great way to minimize environmental impact. Um, not only are transportation emissions minimized, but the waste and energy use from processing and packaging are also eliminated. Um, in addition, you have a lot greater control over what goes into your food in terms of pesticides and herbicides, which pose environmental and human health risks. Um, so as a result of the pandemic, there have been a lot of services that have taken really creative approaches to increasing food availability. Um, again, I'm going to bring up the statistic that um, UVM has determined that one in four Vermonters are currently in, uh, food insecure because of these changes, which makes these programs a lot more important than ever before. Um, and so some traditional Resources available for food security um, include like food pantries, SNAP, and crop cash. Um, and these are still being used right now, but there are also a lot of other great programs out there. And so for those who don't know, SNAP um, is also kind of known as food stamps, which just provides benefits to supplement the food budget of families who need it. And Crop Cash is another Vermont specific program that helps um, these same demographics to be able to afford local foods sold at farmers markets. Um, and another transit relevant method of um, food distribution is um, mobile distribution. Um, so with so many people lacking transportation services, the idea of this is to transport the food instead of the people. Um, the Vermont Food Bank actually started a mobile distribution service um, at the start of the pandemic, and they're serving about 400 families regularly in Winooski, along with other locations around the state. Um, and Shift Meals is also another really great response to local food insecurity during COVID-19. So this was kickstarted and organized by the Skinny Pancake, which is a local restaurant chain. Um, and the goal of this program was to connect the resources of restaurants um, and local food establishments to community members who might be food insecure as a result of the pandemic. This program is actually taking place all around the state and is a really interesting example of what they call um, a reciprocal food economy, which just goes beyond the traditional norm of buying and selling food, um, which is really interesting. And then, so one of these last options is a really great new um, Burlington initiative that was started this summer and it's called Plant for the People. Um, Brianna, you can actually go back to the other one. One more. <laughs> Thanks, sorry. Um, so Plant for the People is kind of a modern take on the Victory Garden. And this program essentially calls on local community members that have the ability to garden to donate a share of their produce to Feeding Chittenden, which is a local food support service. Um, so in, uh, in partnership with local businesses um, and volunteers, this group distributed free seeds and seedlings to those that wanted to get involved. And the goal of this project um, throughout the growing season, which goes into the fall, is actually to collect 
um, 100,000 pounds of produce for the community members in need. Um, and so as we've seen, there's a lot of solutions that are being brought to the forefront to address the greater challenges of food insecurity in Vermont specifically. Um, but something that's emerging as like a huge trend right now is the idea of a victory garden. So they're also called war gardens, um, but they were introduced um, during the time of World War I. And it started as people or governments giving subsidies to um, grow food in public and private re residences um, as a way to reduce the pressure on the public food supply, because during these times people were rationing. Um, and also it was used as a way to boost morale so that gardeners who donated this food to like the public food supply could feel empowered um, and feel that they're contributing their own labor to the home front, which I think is really interesting um, because given the current state of the nation, there has been a pretty significant emphasis on bringing back the Victory Garden. Um, so not only can a steady stream of produce made on your own land be awesome for you, but it can also benefit your neighbors um, because if you're able to, you can use your land and your resources to donate your produce um, to local food distribution organizations. Um, so next I kind of want to talk about what I have done this summer and what I've been working on. Um, so it's a small initiative that I started. Um, it's a project I kind of like to call Pavement to Produce. Um, and this project had a goal of turning unused parking spaces held by individuals in the community into raised garden beds that are capable of producing food. Um, in terms of the transportation side of things, this takes land for people to store their cars and turns it into a place for people to get food instead. Um, and so the widespread occurrence of projects like this could not only alleviate um, environmental barriers and increase food access, but they're also just another way to alternative, alternatively be able to produce food during these times. Um, the reason this project is so relevant um, is because it really just gets at the idea of how we allocate our resources in cities like Burlington. Um, so when you look at an overhead map of the city, which is on the right, um, a lot of it is paved streets that are dedicated to just moving and keeping cars. Um, and a lot of you might not know this, but paved parking areas are pretty bad for the environment. They contribute a lot of harmful runoff. Um, they also contribute to the urban heat island effect. They decrease walkability and just overall create an overdependence on cars. As a community, we pour a lot of money into the car industry, while there are clearly so many people lacking adequate resources um, still. And in the greater scheme of things, this project really just took away from something that is actively harming the environment and transforms it into something that is actively promoting sustainable food production and reducing runoff. Um, this idea of resource allocation can be thought of through the means of social constructs as well, um, because as we've already discussed, a lot of these people that face the barriers of transportation are also the ones that are facing barriers in food security. Um, so much of the infrastructure that we have really only supports cars when a good amount of the population won't even use um, that infrastructure because they don't even have a car. Um, this really isn't a super thoughtful and equitable distribution of the resources that we have. And in the future, um, we really need to rethink about how we use our public spaces to actually benefit the people um, in our community in ways that they need. And so the picture on the left, oh, sorry, you can go back to that last one, thank you. Um, the picture on the left is actually from a project called UpGarden that was started by Landscape architects in Seattle um, and what they did was essentially buy out an unused parking lot that was scheduled for demolition um, and they turned it into a community garden. So projects like this are like popping up all over the country and all over the world essentially and um, they're a really great example of how we can actually help communities that are facing a lot of systematic challenges in the day-to-day. -day. 
Um, so these are just some pictures from my project of this past summer. Um, I constructed these garden beds using wood pallets, which are essentially free at a lot of like local businesses. Um, and I kind of used um, tight woven burlap and row cover to create um, a bottom to the garden bed. And I filled it with soil and plants and um, this middle picture and the picture on the right are after a few weeks um, into the summer. So they really started to um, produce a lot of usable produce, which is awesome. Um, and so now if you were wondering how you can kind of get involved in this food access sector. Um, so one of the, um, ending points of my project is actually that I created a deliverable on how to, uh, a how to guide on how to make your own um, parking space garden. And that's gonna be distributed by sustainable transportation um, in the coming days. So watch out for that. Um, and then also, if you're able to, you should consider starting a victory garden. Um, so even if that means just using a couple um, planted pots like on your patio or your porch if you're able to um that's still like a really great way to start and check out plant for the people um if you need some assistance on getting um plants or other resources to start that um and then lastly um one of the biggest things you can do is support public transportation initiatives in your community to not only help with the issues of food access um, and equity, but also to just increase environmental sustainability um, and safer and more equitable communities. So that's all I have. Um, and I'd love to open the panel to questions or discussion if anyone is interested. Thank you for that, Hannah. Um, yeah, we have a few questions. So the first one is from Abby. And Abby asks, what other streets in Burlington do you think would be best suited to be vehicle free? Um, that's a really great question, Abby. So currently Church Street is permanently vehicle free, but STVT has also done a pretty big um, part in the car free streets initiative in Burlington. Um, and another STVT intern, Jacob, um, has been kind of canvassing for that all summer. And so um, every Saturday, I think Cherry Street, Bank Street, um, parts of College Street, there might be a few more that are, they get closed off every Saturday to cars. Um, and it's working pretty well. And it's allowing a lot of local businesses and restaurants to like expand their um, their usable space um, to increase, you know, revenue, which is really great. Um, but it's kind of shown that, you know, those high traffic areas um, really like lend themselves to being car free. So um, yeah, it seems like the possibilities are kind of endless with that. Yeah. And our, our next question is actually from Jacob. So um, Jacob is asking, what, what got you so passionate about food system, the food system intersection with transportation? Um, so I think what really got me passionate about that is the fact when I realized that, or I kind of was taught in college that um, how we're gonna feed the world is gonna be like essentially the biggest problem of our generation given like climate change and land use. And um, it kind of seemed like that would be a really good use of my efforts. And I've always really liked food and I like the idea of growing food and the practice of growing food. And it just seems like an industry where there's unlimited potential for like new sustainable growth. Completely. And what has the feedback been from um, the people that were interested in creating raised bed gardens in their parking spot? Have they seemed to like really enjoy it and engaged in it as well or? Yeah, that's a great question. So the answer is, yeah. So Jack Hansen, um, he has actually gotten one in his um, parking area. He's a, kind of all of our sustainable transportation bosses and he's really been enjoying it, which is great. Um, and also 
um, one of the people who has one in particular, she lives in the Old North End. Um, and she kind of mentioned that she has always wanted a garden, but was afraid to do it on her own soil because the soil in the Old North End um, has like a history of lead in it. And so she didn't really want to produce food out of that same soil. Um, so she was really excited about the potentials of like having a garden um, and making sure that it's like safe for her and her family, which has really been cool. Yeah, that's awesome. I, I feel like that's something that a lot of people don't really think about is like you want a garden, but technically you don't really have to use the soil right there if you use a raised bed garden or use your parking space or um, if you don't have a car. Um, and then my last question is just, what is the biggest takeaway that you had um, throughout this internship experience and how will you use what you've learned in the future? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, I think like one of the main things that I've gotten out of this is just kind of the concept of like project management. I've never really like had a project and like been the one to demonstrate it like the entire time. Um, which has kind of been a really good lesson in independence and like organization, um, which is definitely something that I think I could have improved upon just being like a little bit more organized um, and had like a little bit of a better plan from the beginning. Um, so yeah, but I think it's been like a really, I think managing your own project is like a really important skill. Um, especially as like a young person um, going into a career and something like this. Um, and then also I just like, think the idea, something that I've gotten from this internship is just like no idea is like too small because someone will always benefit from this. Like this was a really tiny project that like really only affected like three or four people that got a garden. But I mean, those people told their friends that were really interested in the food system. And now those people might tell their friends and like now all of these people might be just a little bit more interested in the food system and like creating more access, um, which I think is awesome. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for being here and um, we hope to have you back. And is there anything else you'd like to say before we end the line? Um, no, that's it. My last point would just be, yeah, don't, feel nervous to support sustainable transportation initiatives in your own community because these mm -hmm. affect a lot of people, more people than you think. Um, and even just as simple as voting for people who support sustainable transportation um, can be huge in creating better communities for everyone. Definitely. Well, yeah. thank you. And I hope for everyone watching, they have a really good weekend and we'll see you later. Thank you.